Well, hi, Monique, and welcome to our class. Uh, I'm Jonathan. Uh, I teach this class with uh, Doron, which you know. And down here is our TA. These are amazing students from our HCI, MA and HCI program, Human Computer Interaction. And I have to say that this, uh, this lecture has created a, a big buzz around the students, and everybody has, uh, are really excited to uh, are really excited to hear you. <laughs> Fantastic, um, which you might also hear the dog barking, but I think that everybody's kind of used to that at this point, right? Yeah, um, yeah definitely. So on cue, the dog starts to bark. Could you not bark? <laughs> so, uh, 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 on, let me just quit my mail so you don't hear so, that. Uh, Noni, they got an introduction to who you are, and I also suggested they watch the TED Talk before, but uh, I'm not sure if everyone did that. Uh, so I was thinking you tell us a little bit about what you're interested in. Well, uh, I, have, maybe... I kind of have a, I have like a, I think it's about 20 minute presentation. Great. Uh, that I could just jump into. Um, and it kind of, it kind of oversees, I'm not the only one with the dog. It kind of oversees the overview, oh, it has an overview of the um, work. How much have you guys done on, on sort of fake, fake uh, characters? Anything? All right. On fake characters, have you done? I have a little bit on fake characters, but before I, I just want to make sure to see, like you know, like uh, digital characters and. Uh, yeah, yeah, talk about that. You've done a lot about that. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip that part of the. I'll, I'll just you know. Uh, uh, skip that part and move into the other things, but it's in the it's in the beginning of the lecture. But I wasn't sure whether you guys have done that or not. No, so, no, you can, you can. No, it's, it's, I think it's nice to see your perspective. Don't worry. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, and forgive me if there's a tiny bit of a repeat, but then after that, it'll all really be more about our work. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do, if you can give me permission, is I'll share screen. You, and, um, you should and, be able to. Okay. Let me just make sure there's nothing else open. Oh, those are the quick time videos in case you want to look at them. And give me one more second. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. And uh, usually Noni is one of the fastest speakers that I've known. Oh, so I know. Just, fit. just, Daron, just slow me down if I go too fast. <laughs> I, I, I wish I could think of people, right? It would be really helpful. Um, and you guys are the BCI people, so I'm counting on you. Okay, I haven't, I haven't done a, a proper presentation now, you guys, like this. And I used to do them, have to do them a couple times a week minimum, and now I'm. A little slow so here we go all right and i'm going to go ahead and minimize this and just let me know if you can hear okay everything we can hear oops sorry we'll be our pioneer noni de la pena what if I could present you a story that you remember with your entire body and not just with your mind? What'd you say? Oh, you're crying! With VR, virtual reality, I can put you on scene in the middle of the story. Get this whole body sensation. There's a bunch of cops here. They're like standing around something going on. Oh, right here. Not cool. On the other side of a fence, there's all these people that are kicking and beating. We can have what I call this duality of presence. A real feeling as if you are in the middle of something that you normally see on TV news. So I started applying all these ideas to what I named immersive journalism. And we all know being there is the most important part of understanding almost anything that's happening. Along in a partnership with America's premier investigative documentary series, Frontline, who had incredible access on solitary confinement cells. What that is, is photogrammetry. And it's exact photographs of a cell you are walking around the exact cell, the exact footprint. You are in the room. It's worked so well for putting people on scene at real stories. Then what? You gotta put the people in there. How do you do that? 
I can now put you in the room with somebody who is videotaped in volume. You can literally walk around them in a volumetric way. Emblematic is among the world's leading producers of virtual and augmented reality. With more than- Okay, sorry. There's nothing to do, I'm gonna go to the next slide. Which way? There we go. Oh, I can't hear the audio, can you? Doesn't matter. Who's real? Left or right? Let's do that again. Right. Left. Neither of them? Left. 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 All right, the left is correct. Hey, how about here? Left. Guy or girl? Right. 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 Left. 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 The guy's real, the woman's fake. Okay. Here. Right. Left. I know this guy. Right. It's right. the one on the left. I know, I think I know him. They're both real. <laughs> <laughs> and here. Right. Both real. Left. Left, left is right. All right. Ma Maggie thought, I mean, uh, she, uh, what's her name is right? Uh, oh my God. Okay, it's morning. You have to forgive me with names. But now, but now look at this one. One on the right is fake, one on the left is real. So, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play this little clip if you want to. It got me thinking it. about my full time employees and their ability to survive on $8 an hour in New York City. And foremost in all of our minds has been the loss and the grief felt by the people of Orlando. Most of us don't get our health care through the marketplace. We get it through our job, or through Medicare or Medicare. And what you should know is that thanks to the Affordable Care Act, your coverage is better today than it was before. Women can get free checkups. And you can't get charged more just for being a woman. To give his employees hope together to pass a common there's a bill that would boost America's very, very hard times. Some progress, at least in, within the small confines of the legal community. I think it's real important. Uh, here we go. Uh, President Barack Obama, uh, when you are giving a speech, uh, make sure you use uh, a lot of pauses. America's businesses have created 14.5 million new jobs over 75 straight months. We're developing technology. Every technology can be used um, in some negative way. And so we all should work towards uh, making sure that it's not going to happen. And uh, even um, one of the interesting directions is that once you know how to create something, you know how to reverse engineer it. And so you can, um, uh, and so one could uh, create methods for identifying um, uh, edited videos versus um, real videos. Okay. So, you know, it's really hard to tell which is real and which is fake, right? Um, and we're living in this kind of world where this idea of fake videos, and of course, fake characters are on the rise. This is my friend, Hao Li, um, where he's been using it with a single uh, uh, shot. Uh, here you go. Give a Hollywood studio ample time and money and can create the most realistic computer-generated characters. Think of a young Princess Leia's appearance in last year's World One. But what if smartphone users had the same power at their fingertips? Today, researchers are developing software that harnesses artificial intelligence to generate lifelike but fake footage. Startups like LA's Pinscreen only need one selfie to start modeling the facial features of a video avatar that can make you look like a video game character or like a real-life person. So then you have those characters, right? And what's going to be the issue when they're, when they're driven by AI? Um, you know, uh, people who are uh, one of the most uh, deep thinkers about AI worry about uh, the dangers of abuses, of course, killer drones, for example, um, surveillance. But um, AI can really amplify discrimination and biases. And that's really one of the biggest concerns to me about how we consider when we are going to be able to map AI to drive um, uh, characters like this. So here's an example. Uh, Amazon had an AI tool for recruiting and, and it was scanning resumes. And they couldn't understand why the AI tool kept recommending men over women. Uh, until they realized that um, men were putting on their resumes the words 
capture and execute. I will capture the market. I will execute the idea, which, which if we think about it, it's kind of funny. It's like almost out of a video game terminology, capture and execute somebody. And the women weren't. And for some reason, the AI thought the capture and execute was a good idea and, um, and, and focus on the women. Okay, so now let's talk about recreation uh, for real stories. Let's talk about the reverse, which, is, which has really been what I've been so focused on for so many years. Um, this was a, a project uh, done with my, our great colleague, Mel Slater, that actually your professor, Jerome Freeman, introduced me to that helped really change the course of my life. But uh, this was a very interesting piece where um, we tried to do uh, putting, putting, you know, putting myself in a robot to do journalism somewhere else. And here's a video of that. Let's see. Play. Oh, I'm sorry, you guys. Why is it doing that? Many, many, many apologies. Looks like when I pulled this up, yesterday and I moved some things around. I stupidly unhooked the boobies. I just got to find them again. Hang on. I just got to get rid of some various. It's, um... Sorry, I'm glad it's the lecture. I told you, I warned you I would be a little bit slow on this. Here we go. Presentations. And it should be in. It's fine. It's fine. It's a, it's a small forum and a few at home. I just, it's going to happen again. So if we don't do this now, um, I'm being dumb. I should just search for it. Sorry, you guys. So check the movies. That doesn't really matter. Um, okay. Do you hear me now, Nani? Do you hear me now, Nani? Nice to meet you. Hola, August. Welcome to Barcelona. Welcome to Barcelona. I don't know, Nani, if I could ask you to raise your arms. A ver si pot aixecar els braços. Ja veieu que els aixeca. Keep them up, because now we'll show the robot. I ara anirem a veure el robot, que ja veieu. Can you move them a little bit more? A ver si els pot moure una mica més. Up and down. Doncs ja veieu que el robot reacciona perfectament amb la Noni. Noni, I'm ready to interview you now for, for a few minutes. Li farem una entrevista a la Noni per veure què li ha semblat aquesta experiència. You're a journalist, ella és una periodista, i fa una estona entrevistat un científic de Barcelona. You just interviewed a, a researcher from Barcelona, but in a, in a body of robot. What was that experience like? So, for me, it starts to feel very natural after a while. Uh, it occasionally, there's some problems with the, the eye movement. I move too fast. But beyond that, very quickly, I'm in there in Barcelona with you. Okay. So um, I have to say that I was in that robot suit for quite a few hours. And by the time I came out of it, uh, I had a lot of uh, connection to um, the body of that robot to the degree that when I saw somebody else uh, being interviewed uh, who had been in the robot, body in that exact same suit, I suddenly went like, oh my God, so weird. She's inside my body. It was just a very weird sensation. But how did I end up in two places at once? I grew up in Venice, California. I went to a high school called Venice High School where we rode. We didn't drift, supposedly. <laughs> uh, and this was our ba uh, look at what our bathrooms were like. Uh, it was a pretty intense place. Um, there was only, you know, my, my senior year there, my last year there was a good year because we only had one shootout on campus. And um, that white, I found only one picture of it, but that white cage, kind of white thing you see in the middle in front of the school, inside of that is a statue of what was like, considered the most famous person who went to Venice High School was an actress from the 1940s, Myrna Loy. And the senior class, part of their graduating prank was to somehow damage Myrna Loy, cut off her arm, cut off her whatever. And one day there was a big announcement that somebody, you know, somebody used dynamite to blow her head off. But this drunken football player I know confessed to me at a party, we didn't use the dynamite, we just used a sledgehammer. But anyway, one day I was driving by Venice High School and uh, uh, they put this big cage around her to protect her, but people had stuffed newspapers in there and lit it on fire. But that was Venice High. But uh, uh, I, was, I was pretty young and, and um, um, 
I worked at a library. I, I just was that kind of a person. And I, I ended up getting into Harvard. And I actually went to Boston when I was 17, having never been to the East Coast in my life with no coat, no boots. And I figured it out, right? I just figured it out. But, but one of the things that kind of um, held me back or whatever in what I really wanted to do, um, that freshman year, they made everybody learn how to do basic programming. And I was very good at it. And I was teaching all these people how to do it. But because I came from Venice High and I was so underprepared compared to the other kids, um, I didn't continue with the classes because everybody kept saying how hard computer science was. Um, so cut to quite a few later when we start getting email uh, and I signed up for CompuServe. I was an early floppy disk of, of CompuServe. I could only find the German uh, picture of it. But um, uh, I won their award for being the most interesting use of their uh, platform. And I actually used it uh, to track down uh, a story of people from uh, what was called Chappaquiddick. It was uh, President, U.S. President Kennedy's younger brother drove off a bridge in uh, Massachusetts uh, with this woman and young woman in it, and he got out and she didn't, although now I think she actually was driving and he was never in the car, but that's a much longer story. And I actually went through and found all the people using databases from CompuServe. Um, and then out came Howard Rheingold's book on virtual reality. And um, uh, this was in the 1990s. And when I read it, I was like, that is what I want to do with my life. But you remember, I didn't have any, any programming skills. Um, even though I was teaching myself HTML, I didn't really have a way to, to do what I wanted to do. And I'd become a journalist. I'd become a correspondent for Newsweek. I'd written for many, many organizations. And I started making documentary films. And one of the films I made uh, was um, called Unconstitutional. And it had a really big piece about uh, uh, Guantanamo Bay prison. We had a family friend who used to call up NPR and go, I really like your piece on Guantanamo Bay prison today. And they'd go, what piece? And he'd go, exactly. So I felt it kind of the same way. I'd done this documentary. I thought the story about Guantanamo Bay prison was still relevant. And it's still relevant, which is really depressing. Um, uh, but... Uh, uh, and along with, a, along with a digital artist named Peggy Weil, who I approached, we applied for a grant to translate an existing significant documented project into digital media. And I wanted to do something about Gitmo. So, but the, you know, the big question is, how do you report on a destination when you're denied access? Uh, journalists weren't allowed on the place. Nobody could get there. Um, this was the original way that detainees were being brought in. They were put in dog cages you may or may not remember. Um, so we made a virtual but accessible version of Gitmo in contrast to the real but inaccessible prison camp. And we did this in Second Life. So it, that was built in, in, in Second Life in 2007. Um, and just to give you an idea of some of the journalistic reference points we use, uh, this was how detainees were being brought in. That's on the left is a photograph that uh, uh, somebody from the military smuggled out to show how people were being transported there. And this is what uh, we did to you in Second Life. You gave up your uh, avatars. We, there was a HUD that, that you gave up your avatars uh, control, and we would put you in a quote-unquote uh, position like this. Um, and here is a little short... Uh, as soon as that. I had put on my orange jumpsuit, I was thrown into the back of a C-17 transport plane, and... You are immediately bound, and then a black hood comes over the vision of your avatar. Shut up! Oh. We then integrated some sounds that were based on descriptions of what real detainees heard. When the black hood is removed, you find that you're in a cage. Most of the footage is from original Defense Department shots of detainees in Guantanamo Bay. A replica of Camp Delta will be added to this camp X-ray soon. Noni wants it to include a habeas corpus game, enhancing the simulation of a place outside of the law. Like a regular video game where you get your choices. What do you do now? Call your parents? Call your lawyer? Ask what you're in here for? And the answers are, no, you can't call your parents. No, you can't call your lawyer. Sorry, not allowed to give you that information. As soon as Oops, I sorry. So we did do that habeas corpus game, which basically puts you in this what we call the legal black hole. You came in there and you could query the environment, you know, hey, can I call my family? And the guard would say, You can't call your family. Can I call my lawyer? You can't call my lawyer. Uh, can you tell me what I'm in here for? Sorry, I don't have that information. And you would just be trapped in there forever. 
So I rebuilt the piece uh, in Unity for the Moscow Museum of Modern Art, where it showed in 2013. Um, and that was a point where I had to become a better C-sharp coder in order to really work in the game engine. And I was determined to do this. At this point, I was working as a research fellow at USC, and I went in to take a C-sharp coding course. Um, and this is what a course it should have looked like, but that's a stock photo. Um, and this is what it really looked like, right? I was the only woman in 30 young men, right? Um, kind of an intense experience. And it was amazing how it really made me catch my breath, but I had to just keep going through it. And I also used a lot of YouTube. This guy, Bergzer Arcade, was my real go-to on YouTube, where I'd, I'd never had to feel stupid, right? I think it's kind of like now all my team is uh, working from home, and so I can play a lot more video game, uh, VR games at work, because it doesn't matter how silly I look. And also at that time, the head of Unity, um, uh, David Hagelson, actually gave me, I, 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 was, I was working with one of those students and I needed a pro version for, for the museum because I, I had the Unity student version stamped all over it. And I actually emailed David Hagelson and within an hour I had a free uh, professional copy. And um, uh, one of the students basically said to me, oh my God, that's like calling the head of you know, Mercedes and having them give you a free car within an hour. Anyway, so I got some points that way. But let me tell you a little bit about some of the research I also did in Second Life. Um, and I think that this is sort of interesting even today because we're going to be going into more and more virtual world issues, right? Um, people are coming together and, and we're going to see ourselves in virtual world stuff. Um, uh, and um, I started looking at what was sexual harassment because I was bringing students into Second Life. And I wanted to see what kind of experiences they would have. And we did a, uh, a study. Um, and really initially really started out looking at like, do women feel as harassed like they do in the real world or on bulletin boards and how do they feel in virtual worlds? And they found just like we'd seen in other studies that situations were more harassing than, than for them. They felt it was more harassing than men did. But then I realized that in the data we had, we collected men saying that they were playing with female avatars. So I wanted to know like, what, what did the men who are playing as women feel, right? And amazingly, when men were playing women, they felt significantly more harassed than the women did. Super interesting project, super interesting. But the real takeaway here is this. We, con we connect to the digital representations of ourselves, even if we're swapping genders. And as we, uh, uh, I don't know, you know, we could have been meeting in hubs, in Mozilla hubs or another virtual world instead of Zoom, um, but we're gonna see ourselves more and more represented in trying to, to be inside spatial spatial environments, which is where hardwired to drop representations of ourselves is real. Um, and the digital sense is really quite powerful. Um, this was a really early study that I always loved to cite of um, uh, the guy seeing himself from behind in the camera. Uh, that camera's actually, you know, when, reflecting what he sees through those goggles. And they would touch the real body, but then touch the fake body and he'd feel like the fake body was being touched. Um, uh, uh, even if they didn't actually touch the body, et cetera. But most importantly, they brought a hammer down in front of the camera and he jumped because he felt that's just where his body was. Um, this was a study that came out of Duke and I'm wondering what their final results are, but uh, what they were looking at was brain computer interface. And I'm sure Daron's much more expert on this and can do many more stories on about this. But I found this one interesting because they were uh, trying to use uh, BCI to, um, help somebody with, uh, uh, with a paraplegic walk again to control the devices. But what they found was that after a year of imagining their body through the, through the rift, um, that they actually started having synapses returned in their brain to control bodily input. So um, let me give you an example. It wasn't like they got up and you know, ran, but they actually could control their bowel movements. And that's a huge quality of life issue. So all these embodiment issues, uh, I started using for journalism. And just because I better check in, everybody's there, right? Yeah. Everybody? Okay, just making sure that I'm, I haven't lost anybody. I, it's at full screen on my, on my PowerPoint. Okay, so immersive journalism is a novel way to utilize gaming platforms and virtual environments to convey news, documentary, and nonfiction stories. Put the audience at a virtual reconstruction of the scene we use real visual and audio material from good boots on the ground investigative journalism, right? And really it's not a new idea. Journalism has always tried to carry the reader or audience to where the reporting is taking place. 
which is what Martha Gellhorn called the view from the ground. Um, and, well, uh, and one of our famous reporters from 53 to 57, uh, he had a series called You Were There. These Texians, as they are called, are Mexican citizens. Their province is part of the Mexican nation, but their difficulties with the central government have steadily increased. Now there is open rebellion. March 5th, 1836. The Siege of the Alamo. You are there. So that kind of commanded you to be there, right? He was trying his best to get you there. And then early documentary games had a similar thing. There was JFK Reloaded, uh, which let you play the shooter. And they had you like be in the book depository to see if you could actually make the shot and deal with the controversy. And um, once somebody made the shot, they pulled the game from the web. There was Kuma Wars, uh, where we had a presidential candidate, John Kerry, um, there was a whole controversy about whether he deserved his medal in Vietnam, and it was, you know, one of those uh, muddy the water kind of stories, and um, they let people play John Kerry to see if he deserved it. And then there was 9-11 Survivor, uh, made by, uh, a, at the time, that uh, you, uh, it was this University of California, San Diego student, John Brennan at the time, and his team. Um, I ended up working with John on many things, including Hunger in L.A., um, but uh, before I met him, they'd done this piece where you just played a victim. He had, he had um, uh, been watching, he'd been kept gaming late, and it was like three in the morning, and his TV was on, and the breaking news started, and, and he started seeing people jumping from the building, and this was in some ways trying to make sense of it. And as they noted, the game itself is not really a game at all. It keeps no score, actual track of time. It's merely a moment caught in time. And I think that's, it's, very much reflects what journalism is. Um, I, as I said, Duran introduced me to Mel and uh, uh, Slater and uh, uh, Maria Sanchez Vives, who really helped change the course of things. Um, I had my first full walk around experience uh, in a HMD um, with uh, their piece on um, uh, this bystander effect. Um, and you basically were in a bar scene where the guy in the red jersey, the guy in the white jersey is drunk, the guy in the red jersey um, uh, actually um, uh, is, you know, attacked. Um, and how do people react, right? So um, once I had that experience in Mel's lab, and Maria's lab, um, uh, I really knew that I couldn't go back to sitting in a chair. Um, I really wanted to make things spatial and volumetric. <clears throat> and um, I'd had all this research for my documentary, um, and I wanted to talk about how do you report on stress positions in VR, where we'd had a ton of, of information about, you know, oh, people put in stress positions, but it's not that big of a deal. Um, and uh, using interrogation logs of somebody who the government said um, was absolutely tortured, uh, we tried to rebuild that story. So this is early days, and Duran actually tried this early days with us too. I remember I just landed from the airport and they put me in this environment and I was afraid they were actually going to torture me or do something while I was in there as a prisoner. So the, the, the deal is that like people were wearing the breathing strap, they could see themselves in the mirror, see that that breathing strap. And amazingly afterwards, people reported that um, they were hunched over in a, in a, in a um, even though they were sitting upright in this chair. So, you know, in a, in a stress position, everybody felt their body had been transferred into this stress position. So, you know, the question became, like, what about the subject subjectivity of experience? Does this raise questions about what we can do to our, our, read our quote unquote viewer, reader? Well, this came out after we made that piece and it's probably the only video I know of that shows what actually was going on in these rooms. And I really feel like we were, we were very close to what, what was really going on. Oh, 
Anyway, you can see it yourself if you want to. And that led to this piece. Um, and uh, Jerome is one of the authors on this as well. Um, that led to this whole idea of the immersive journalism uh, uh, concept, where it all came from. And um, it started really out of that lab and because of Jerome's work. So right now, it still remains the second most downloaded in the history of the MIT Journal presence. And the next thing we did, I started working with Hunger in LA, which I talked about at the beginning a little bit. Um, I was working as a research uh, fellow, and the students were working on a piece that was, a, you know, at that point, relatively innovative um, web piece uh, with audio, video, text. And I wanted to do a VR piece, and I asked the students who wants to do one, and nobody did. And I had to find a high school student who was graduating, and she helped me. That reminds me, today's her birthday. I've got to reach out to her. Um, and she helped me go out to food banks and start recording audio. And one day she came back from this scene and um, this long, 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 long line, this is during the downturn, but we're seeing it again now, of people waiting in line for food. Um, uh, of course, there was no virus in, but, and a man in this long line with diabetes, he didn't get food in time and he collapsed into a diabetic coma um, while he was waiting for food. And we had to recreate that, and we had no two, money. No, 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 take four, mocap ready. So to recreate the scene, we had to use mocap, and there's John Brennan in the mocap scene. And you had to play every single character in the line. And this is what it ended up looking like. Okay. <laughs> Okay, he's having a seizure. Okay. Yeah, yeah, please. Can anybody who is calling them right now? Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, eight is, uh, eight is, 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 eight Birdman and Revenant. So that was Alejandro's first uh, version into this uh, world, his first step in. But Hunger got into Sundance, and uh, at that point, we really only had the fake space headset, um, which was $50,000 a pair, and they had the lab. Mark Polis said, you're not taking that anywhere. So we had to make uh, goggles. Uh, you can see those two dots on the screen. Those represent where your pupils are. I have a really skinny head, and the guy in the mask has a really big fat head uh, who's making that, and we were trying to work out what's best here. But we showed up with goggles that look like that, and uh, this was the uh, opening day. So you can see she's down on the ground, really upset, and worried and trying to talk to the seizure victim. She leans over to try to help them, et cetera, et cetera. And we saw that uh, over and over. And this is what you see in the beginning. She starts crying, but you see this over and over and over. People trying to talk to him, to spin with him, to be near him. Um, and amazing, people with minds fill in all kinds of stuff. Like this woman in red, she, she starts to steal food when um, everything goes chaotic. And somebody even said to me, oh, I could tell she was a heroin addict by the needle marks in her arm. And then the guy on the ground, you know, these are, these were all characters who I got for like a couple hundred bucks or so given to me, or I built the whole thing for $700 and a lot of favors. And um, they said, oh, I could tell that was a seizure victim because his knees were all scraped up. I mean, these were the comments to me. People's minds fill in lots of things. I always talk about in relation to this, which this is the Virgin Mary in a tortilla, in case you didn't know. But more about that headset built by Palmer Lucky, um, uh, the kid with a big fat head, um, who was uh, in our crash in my hotel room and driving the truck back. And nine months later, he started Oculus Rift. Um, and of course, then you have that most memed cover of uh, Time Magazine, in which not one woman is mentioned. What a surprise. 
and um, you know, there he is doing Gangnam Style, whatever. But but Alejandro and uh, Lubecki, who uh, called Chivo, um, they then went on to make a VR piece that I worked with them, Carne Arena, and uh, that's when the very first um, Oscar was awarded, and that was when very kindly Alejandro called me out on stage at the Oscars. But when the DK1 came out, it was just a sit down only headset and um, that was kind of a bummer. And um, uh, like, like Mel and team, I wanted to move around. Um, so first when I got Oculus number 154, I stapled trackers to it, but um, I just really didn't, um, I didn't really like it. So um, I had to start making my own headsets and we started pretty 3D printing out of my mom's garage. We found, I found lenses from a bankruptcy sale um, and then we were even making controllers at the time, track controllers. Um, that was the crazy um, uh, $100,000 tracking equipment that I had to find, but I got it for $7,000. Um, and it was because I wanted to tell stories like this one about this man, Anastasio Hernandez Rojas, who was, came to the US as a young boy and in the downturn couldn't get any work. Um, he had uh, five kids with his wife in the US and uh, uh, including recent twins. And on Mother's Day, he stole a bottle of tequila and a steak, presumably for her. He got busted, cap caught, deported, and then he tried to sneak it across the border. Um, and uh, this is uh, an audio recording to people captured what happened to him. And we made a piece that then ended up on BuzzFeed, so. Uh, although I guess if you guys saw my TED Talk, uh, you probably saw this piece. So I'm gonna skip it and I'm gonna move on uh, to say that you can watch that on uh, being a witness in virtual reality later, uh, but that had almost a million views. Um, uh, so like there was a story that barely got any mention in the press, and now it's got nearly a million views on YouTube, which is pretty amazing. Um, and pages and pages of discussion about race in America. Um, and this woman who was so amazing, who slipped her phone out. You know, this is how we made her. We put her on our lights, and then put her in as, as herself as much as we could. And then Ashley put her in a motion capture suit and actually had her reenact her memory of the night as much as uh, she could from her audio. I then went on to do something for the World Economic Forum on Syrian refugees. Uh, I'm gonna do a quick trailer here. And this shows you a little bit about the detailed maps, art bibles that we did to make sure that we had everything that we could for recreating this, the, the, the piece. Um, and then at the World Economic Forum, we had everybody from Peter Gabriel to the late Senator John McCain go through it. And um, then it ended up amazingly in London's famous Victoria and Albert Museum and didn't have any advertising. And yet we ended up with uh, uh, dozens of pages, I think it was like dozens and dozens of pages of a guest book. They told me it was the largest outpouring of comments they'd ever had in a show quite frightening, absolutely fascinating, a real feeling as if you're in the middle of something you normally see on TV news, immerse, it's so real, absolutely believable. <clears throat> and then this one, this was a very difficult piece to experience as a Syrian whose family is still living in alms. Although I felt the piece was inappropriate at first, I have certainly changed my mind after experiencing it firsthand. It's important for the world to bear witness to the situation in Syria, and this is a powerful and effective way to do that. I hope you're able to grow this technology further. Hello, this is Charleston County 911. We received a call from this number. Is everything okay? My nephew's on the phone. He just called. I asked us to come to, her, come to your house because my sister, baby daddy, has a gun on her. So this puts you on scene where two sisters have called the police to try to get help, and each one has their cell phone on, and they're trying to rescue a third sister from a fatal attack by an ex-boyfriend. Um, and you can see we tried to recreate it as faithfully as we could digitally. Um, and um, uh, we were very careful about what we played. But we put you on scene here. And we had people saying, you know, I'd never been in the room with somebody with a gun on them. Um, it was a pretty uh, 
uh, a pretty extraordinary piece. Um, we also put you on scene at health clinics in the U.S. so that you could see what women uh, experience um, when they try to go to health clinics. Um, we tried to scan characters, and then we used facial capture to um, uh, use real audio. He's just lip syncing real audio about what gets yelled at young women. You're a whore. You're a whore. You're a whore. You're a little whore. How about stop being a whore? You whore. Shame on you. Start closing your legs. Start having some respect for your body. Um, interestingly, we've done some research around that piece and people who saw the piece they were less tolerant of a range of, cl of, of clinic harassment. And uh, even those with moderate conservative views had increased empathy towards women. And they said they would support legislation that would protect women. Oh dear, I've got to send this to somebody. Then we did a piece on LGBTQ homelessness. Um, I'll just show you a little trailer here. Forty percent of homeless youth come from the LGBTQ community because they've been thrown out from their homes due to their sexual orientation. After I gave my talk at TED Women, the actress Sada Ramirez approached me and she really wanted to make this piece about homelessness in the LGBTQ community. In collaboration with the True Colors Fund, I was lucky enough to begin working with them on finding the right material to tell the story. We ended up using the audio of Daniel Pierce who was thrown up by his own family, and he happened to record the terrible conversation that ensues. Oh, don't get off of me! What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? So by putting the audience in the middle of this physical moment, you know, using the motion capture, putting on digital characters, and then making it life-size so it happens all around you, it's so startling. Suddenly see you've heard, which is disturbing enough, um, and maybe you've watched videos of this type of scene, but if it's there and you feel physically vulnerable, you connect to Daniel and to what he's going through in a way that um, I don't think any other medium affords. It, it, it is a really significant and powerful moment to be there with Daniel when, when he's that vulnerable, when he's surrounded by people who hate him just for being who he is. You're twisting my words. You are a everybody. You are a completely different person. Let me tell you something. You have a business. We also use new technologies, uh, something called volumetric capture, which is with a company called 8i, which we film from every direction around a person, and it creates a hologram. And we use that moment, that technology, as kind of a postscript to offer messages of, messages of hope. Uh, I'm going to have to fly through this, you guys. I realize I, I, I made it a little bit too long. Um, we also did this crazy one at uh, Formula One because we have to have some fun sometimes. And we did this um, uh, crazy one where you got to ride the set track and you were racing against each other. I think it was the first um, uh, piece where it was multiplayer inside in VR. And a lot, quick note on kinematic versus cinematic. There's been a lot of 360 video work we've done, beautiful stuff. Um, this actually I'm really kind of proud of. We shot this in the Amazon Spheres, which is the company Amazon um, hired me to make. Oh, did I turn it off? No, it's playing. It's not playing. What's the matter with you? Uh, a couple of these did not keep. I want to show it to you though. Um, uh, sorry. Let's just take a look at that one. Oh, no, you're not able to see it, are you? Oh, well, never mind. Um, let me that, open that back up and see if I can just show you one little bit of it. Ah, uh, let me check that. It hasn't been released, but if I show you, let's see if we get in there. Yeah, okay. At least you can see some of this. Um, that is um, a macro time lapse 360 camera. Uh, it's not playing very smoothly, unfortunately, right now. It's actually really smooth, and it puts you down at a at a micro, you know, like a like an ant in 360 and a time lapse. It's My name is Ron Galliardo. I'm the senior manager of horticultural services here at Amazon. 
I do my walks through the sphere. So we put that, we put people in that, which is super, super cool. And um, then we also did a piece with Lynn Herzog, who's here next, um, which puts you uh, on dead and dying languages, um, which is also a 360 video um, project. And we had uh, the largest showing of synchronous 360 video at one time in Washington, DC. We've done a bunch of AR projects, uh, a smart city project. Um, this one is a... Uh, um, Hi, all. we're in the uh, emblematic offices taking a look at the latest version of the Wall Street Journal's Project Tango AR app. So once we're in the app, we're going to go ahead and um, it's going to prompt us to... It's a, sorry, I'm just going to skip through that, but it's a, it's, a, it's a data visualization of the stock market that was live. A little bit more on photogrammetry. If you guys aren't doing any yet, you, I'm sure you will be. And if you look up on the left-hand side, that picture is click, 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 click. That's one photograph. And the right is what the digital model is coming out. There's lots of these uh, uh, apps. Uh, a lot of people like Displayland. I'm just starting to play with it. Uh, that's Displayland for making uh, volumetric objects. And I use that in the, you know, obviously for the Women's History Project that I talked a little bit about, um, in which I had no money again. But I wanted to do a piece about this badass woman editor named Mary Catherine Goddard, who had a, you know, uh, a revolutionary era for the U.S. Um, printing press, uh, and she was a newspaper editor. Um, and when when the guys decided they needed a formal Declaration of Independence in which they signed their names, they hadn't put their names on it before because uh, it was treason. So um, she printed the first uh, uh, publication. And at the very bottom, she's put her own name, Mary Catherine Goddard, um, uh, and it's printed by Mary Catherine Goddard. She'd never put her name, full name on anything else, but she basically signed the Declaration of Independence. And when she died, she, uh, her, in her will, she left her money, all of her money to a slave and freed her. She was pretty badass. We didn't have any money to make uh, a revolutionary era printing press room, so we found one that we could scan, and that's how we were able to make that piece. You saw a little bit about this uh, piece on, on how we made the solitary confinement cell. Um, we brought the guy who spent four and a half years in solitary um, into uh, LA to be shot um, on the 8i stage. And here's a little quick trailer on that. When I walked into my cell, I didn't realize that I would be spending five and a half years of my life in solitary confinement. I look fine. But I'm not. 18 years old, I was new to the system, never really been in trouble before. As an adult, the solitary confinement and the sensory deprivation, years of it drove a relatively sane young man insane. I cut myself thousands of times just over and over and over. We also uh, did some work on climate change. This piece is, you know, more and more Valuable, we took a 360 camera and we strapped it to the top of a helicopter. When you look at the glacier like that, vantage point of a helicopter, it looks like it's going to be here forever. And then we put you inside the helicopter so that you're flying over drone. I can send you, uh, actually they're up on Steam uh, project, uh, uh, the solitary confinement one after solitary and this one, which is Greenland melting. Um, and here's the trailer on that completed piece. Well, when you look at the glacier like that, vantage point of an helicopter, it looks like it's gonna be here forever. How could it possibly go away? The glacier retreated more in the last 15 years than in the previous 70 years. We'd like to know why.
three, two, one, drop. So check out that blue suit. Okay, so before I talk about this, that blue suit was really important because when he showed up to get filmed on that stage, he knew he was gonna be inside his airplane and he wanted to be in his, filmed in his, his suit. And the Frontline, which is the big news organization was like, but if you put him in the suit, people will think that he was in his airplane when we made this, when in fact we made him in a separate stage and put him inside the plane. And he was like, no, I want to be filmed in my suit. And he's like, what, you want me to be wearing my flip flops? I'm, I'm here in Santa Monica, I'm not doing that. And uh, um, in the end he won, but it was a really interesting ethical question. And of course, telling people what volumetric structure is, was difficult, they would send back images like this, a flat still, and we would have to take it into ZBrush and actually create it in, in volume. It was a pretty intense and complicated project, but it was good. Uh -oh. Can you guys hear me okay? And this is the final piece. I'm still good, right? Yes, yes. Great, okay. I mean, and obviously this whole idea of being underwater was pretty amazing. All right, and again, our studies have shown that we took some of these things and we we put them out in, in a regular, uh, you know, format, 360 video, and then we put it in volumetric. A walk around real there it was by far the effective. Um, people felt that that was what really worked for them. Um, and I think the, the best important thing was it, it really demystified the science. Is real or not? Letting plane and drop that you know, guy while well, he drops that tube because Honey? yeah we're kind of losing you mid uh, sentence you having some uh, communication issues oh, I must be competing with everybody I'm going to skip into the end and because um, there's a lot more here but um, uh, the last note I want to say is that um, in that in that piece that Maria uh, that uh, Maria Santos Vives and Mel Slater did on the bystander effect, well, um, the, you know, it's based on this Kitty Genovese story. Thirty-seven people who saw the murder didn't call the police. Um, uh, and the bystander effect. Well, it turns out that that was not true. Um, and that that piece which showed that actually people did try to intervene in this situation turned out uh, to be more accurate and that the New York Times had to issue a, re a retraction about what they'd reported so many decades earlier. And, and that's really important also with our, with our, our fake news stuff. Okay, I, the reason why I'm gonna push ahead is because I really wanna get an opportunity to show you guys about reach. I really put a lot of stuff in here. Um, I know, I know. I want to show you guys more recently one more thing here. We've got a lot of work, and I should have gotten more than the recent work. This was shot recently on a stage, a Microsoft stage, to show you how good characters are getting. Um, she was an Olympic fencer, and she used to compete against this guy when she was 10, because there was no other, you know, women to really compete against. And then in college, they were competing against each other, and now they're engaged to get married. So I just like this piece, because it's, I think, the first volumetric kiss that, uh, has ever been captured. So, um, and we are working on all kinds of very interesting other projects. And I'll come back for another lecture another time to talk about more recent stuff. Cause you got the, <laughs> you got the, you got the uh, enough of the back stuff. But what I really want to show you about is reach. Um, and I think that's in here. So reach, the reason why reach is important is um, it is going to let anybody, let me just do a new window. Um, start to build volumetric content because right now it's really hard to do it. And um, I'm going to just build something for you guys. And then if you guys want to use it, you can. And this way, if this is done, you'll have some time to ask questions about it. So it's beta.reach.love. Remember, this is done bootstrap, so it's kind of alpha plus beta minus. So forgive some of the problems. But I'm going to do. A new project, and even with my bad internet, all right, the base in which you're building, and now I'm going to get a photogrammetry environment, 
So I'm fighting with everybody here, kids at home, everybody at the family. Yeah, it's not doing badly. So there's the vo volumetric environment. You want to kind of bring it down to your red grid. I know you probably can't well, but I'm going to do it here for you and then I'll turn the lights on better. So you can't see it that well. Let's go to our light. It comes with two lights immediately, but you can add as many as you want from this field of things. But I'm going to go to my light two, which is directional, and I'm going to um, make it a little brighter. And I'm going to show you how I can literally just drag it across my landscape to put it where I want it to be. Right? So. Okay. So now I can add a sky. So um, we have a couple of nice night sky skies. We have a night sky that's kind of cool. Um, but the real sky, which is a panorama, you can also put in a 360 video. I'm not going to do that right now because of the uh, bandwidth that'll require. But you can add a 360 video, right? Um, and if I match my lighting, I'd match my background pretty well. Um, but I'm not going to do that right now. I'm going to add an object. Um, I got this from Sketchfab. I'll show you how you get them. But I like this object because he's, he kind of shows me everything. He's really big. So I need to just click the scale button. Scale him down. Let's zoom in there. He's still too big. Something like that. And then let's position him over. It's still quite big, but not so big that we can't. And it's got an animation. So it plays animation. And see, I'm building all this in the browser in Firefox. So I highly, I highly recommend you use Firefox to do it. Chrome works, Safari a little less, but um, it's kind of fun. I'll show you when it's published, it doesn't matter. But um, you can add text, you can add audio, you can add a video character. Um, I had some students in, so I always like this one kid who's dancing. Scale them up. Okay. And before I do all this, let's um, let's grab something from Sketchfab. Can somebody give me a, a an object that they would like to add to that scene? Somebody shout out something. Oh. Sorry. A goat, an animal, of some sort. Okay. Oh, let's see if we got a goat. How about a downloadable goat. All right. Let's see if we can find one that's free. That's the main thing. Him. He's cute. He, oh no, it costs money. People are starting to charge wisely. Uh, wow, all the goats are, God, who would have thought that goats were so valuable? <laughs> They're trendy now. I guess so. Uh, all right, how about this bronze goat sculpture? Because it's free. He's a little bit weird, but never mind. Oh, he's a million triangles, you guys. Let's not get that right, right now. Too big. It'll be beautiful, but just for bandwidth reason, we don't need to do a million triangles. It's just got to be a lower poly goat. Jeez, goats all cost money. Never had this problem before. I think it's good. Don't goat. worry. Try boats. Okay, here we go. Small 3.4 thing, right? That's not too bad. Let's just download that one. Okay, and you got to grab a GLTF version. You can see that you can do USDZ too, but uh, for AR. But uh, here you go. Download on the GLTF. One hopes. Uh, I'm really bad with. Well, that's going on. Let's go back to our reach. And I'll just show you what he looks like looped. 
And let's see how long it's taking for that file to go. We got to set our camera so that our camera is in the right place when we first start out. That's our camera. You see it's got kind of a white line that tells you where. And here's your preview button. Oh, that's not too bad. And our goat is downloaded. So now you can add a new object. And you just grab the goat. You can just drag it into load a new object. Go away from it. Works better. Okay, video. The lighting's good. Um, and, Object is oh. Well, you saw how I added Binder. Um, that's it. There we go. I'd be able to just drop that guy in here. But we're, we're in a little bit of a bandwidth crunch here with all of a sudden everybody's on the internet in the house. Oh, and we even lost it. But the good news is, my minute twins. I think, Noni, we're uh, kind of losing you. You know, you're very intermittent. Running out of time. And no, I'm saying, yeah, there's no bandwidth. <clears throat> and also it's getting quite late in Israel, you know, for goats. So, cause it's kind of almost, it's the middle of the night. So I, we could do without- All right, well, let me just- I don't know if it's just me or- uh, How we- No, it's the same with me. No, we can barely hear that. Noni. Yeah, the problem, Noni, is we lost you, kind of, uh, we kind of lost you. Okay. Now, did that help? I'm going to quit this. I'm going to stop sharing my <laughs> okay. Well, let's see if she, she can uh, maybe reconnect so uh, we have some time for questions. And if, if she doesn't uh, manage to, we can uh, refer. <laughs> let's see if she reconnects and if not, we can do the uh, uh, question section offline. And do you want to maybe mail her and uh, tell her to maybe uh, snap, uh, go out and come in again without the uh, screen sharing? Yeah, 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 I'll try. <clears throat> uh, I think I only have, I don't have a phone right now. Whose idea was it to, to uh, ask, ask for a goat? Put an, ask for a ball or a cube? Huh. No, I, I see it. Uh, we got a lot of on the phone, but my, I see that the Zoom is, uh, the screen yeah. sharing has died. But I think. I came back on my phone because my computer just. I think my son started his Zoom class and my daughter started her Zoom class and everybody got started. So. I yeah. decided to come back on my phone and say goodbye. So the nice thing about those pieces, when you publish them, you can embed them in a website. And I'll send Doron some um, uh, examples of videos, and he can show you how easy it is to publish it and then embed it into the web. And, and you can look at it on all devices. Um, so it's like a web-based tool for easy uh, generation of volumetric content. That's right. 
Web, it's a WebXR tool. And it usually, it usually works pretty well. I probably, I just didn't make it into the office to too many people on the internet this morning here in the house. Uh, no, you, you, do you have a few seconds or minutes for uh, any questions that, that the group Absolute, uh, Absolutely, absolutely, sure. Yeah, yeah, I think, um, thanks a lot for your, uh, for the talk. <clears throat> uh, I think, I don't know, for me, it's been like a 10 hour Zoom uh, session, so I'm a little bit over Zoom, but uh, maybe, I, I think my understanding is the uh, students are finding this relevant, so uh, why don't we have take uh, questions from you. Remember to unmute yourself and yeah. uh, ask. Uh... So any questions uh, for the stu from the students, if you want to talk, just uh, unmute yourself and ask away. Yeah, I have a question, if I may. Sure. Um, Noni, thank you so much uh, for being uh, an inspiration to all of us. Uh, I just want to ask, uh, you had a lot of experience with 360 videos and also uh, uh, actual, you know, VR. Um, what works better on, on people? Feeling the VR itself with the six degrees of freedom or 360 video? What works in terms of uh, engagement and emotional uh, engagement as well? So that's one of the studies we did, which I was, um, I don't know if I got cut off, uh, but for the Greenland melting and the solitary confinement piece, we exported it as a 360 video, uh, as a flat, just regular video, and as a volumetric walk around piece, you know, full walk around immersive. And by far the immersive piece was much more engaging, effective, uh, by far. So there's nothing like spatial content. Um, 360 video can be very beautiful still, but um, but the data is very clear that spatial content was the most effective. Thank you. Great. Really important. Anyone else? It's late for you guys, and I yeah, threw a lot at you. This so time. I have a question about the uh, the re. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Sorry. Can you can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, hi. Thank you, uh, Nani, for the great um, about the 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 re. I wanted to know if we can um, if we can export the scene that we create on Reach to um, to um, to um, Unity or other uh, development platform for for VR. Not not right now, but the. But you can is, this, is this something that is supported on this, uh, this uh, platform? No, no such luck. We, again, we built it on very, um, uh, on pennies rather than pounds. And, um, but it's kind of cool because you can just publish it into the browser. And I'm sorry that I didn't get a chance to show you that because it's super, it's not really necessary to bring it into Unity, right? Um, uh, the point is it's a lightweight version of Unity in the browser. So hopefully that remains useful to you, but uh, right, you know, one day perhaps we go the other way into Unity or Unreal, but we're really, our, our goal here is to make it so that anybody can make stuff really quickly and easily um, uh, from all these different libraries of content out there of, uh, of, you know, and also I didn't show you the video, the way you add a video, it's just a green screen video, uh, we actually did one where a guy just put up a gray sheet behind him. Um, we had to do a little bit of cleanup, but it means that even though the volumetric characters are better, um, we can also show you flat characters uh, very quickly and they look pretty good in that scene. So the point is to have like a more of a lightweight version of Unity um, uh, that is a simple storytelling, uh, more YouTube-like than um, in terms of volu volumetric YouTube rather than full game engine Unity. Uh, Unity and Unreal offer such strong um, tools, but we're trying to offer something very simple and easy that anybody can participate with. Thank great. you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, definitely great. The, uh, I think the, the complexity of the software and platforms that are required to uh, uh, learn in order to be a, a VR or AR developer are quite uh, complex. We're, we're also working on Unity with all the students here. It takes a long time. Hmm? 
yeah, I know myself how hard it is to learn how to do the C sharp programming for Unity. It's hard. So yeah, that's why hard. we that's why we built this button based system. Um, and again, maybe we can come and have another quick little lecture about Reach itself, and then I can show you a little bit more about publishing, etc. cetera. Uh, but we should do it for my office when I've got better internet. Yeah, and we can also do that for the whole program because all of them are learning Unity, and maybe they'll be interested in also learning the, the new uh, lightweight uh, platform. But in general, I just want to say that, as Mao said, uh, you are a true inspiration in the world of VR and AR, and also in the world of uh, accessibility of coding and stuff. Uh, most of us are not from the world of of uh, computer sciences, me included, and we find uh, such inspiration uh, really helpful in learning and being um, able to do things. We learn from, from the grades and then we believe in ourselves and then we perform. That's what, what I, I, I always tell the students here in, in the bachelor program, that if you believe in yourself and you want to do something, you, you're able to do it. As you said, uh, as you started your career, uh, basically. So thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much for your time and, and um, hope you found it interesting. And um, I look forward to connecting to you again on Reach. And have a good evening, you guys. You must be tired. End of the day. And look, there's the dog.